Hobart, the capital city of Tasmania, Australia's island state, is built on both sides of the Derwent River. Linking the main business centre on the western side of the river and the dormitory suburbs on the eastern shore is the Tasman Bridge, a multi-span, high-level, post-tension concrete structure with a total length of 1,420 metres and a maximum height above water of 49 metres. When opened to traffic in 1964, after five years' construction, the Tasman Bridge carried four 3.3 metre wide traffic lanes. The Lake Illawarra, a bulk ore carrier commissioned in 1958 by the Australian National Line. With a total length of 138 metres and fully laden displacement of 14,500 tonnes, she carried a crew of 42 officers and men. On the evening of Sunday the 5th of January 1975, the Lake Illawarra, fully laden with a cargo of zinc concentrate, was travelling upriver, bound for the Risden Wharf of the Electrolytic Zinc Company, when at 9.25pm she collided with the Tasman Bridge, bringing down a section of the bridge and herself sinking soon after. Next morning, the extent of the damage above water became evident. Three 1,000 tonne spans and two supporting piers had completely collapsed and the adjoining piers had been damaged. Seven of the crew of the Lake Illawarra and five travellers on the bridge lost their lives. Some drivers escaped an horrific death by a matter of inches. Within hours of the disaster, army, police and commercial divers set about the task of firstly recovering bodies and cars and then inspecting the degree of damage to the still standing structure. Diving was restricted by poor visibility and by limited diving time due to the depth of water, as deep as 40 metres. The location of the sunken ship and fallen bridge debris had to be ascertained to determine where new bridge foundations could feasibly be built. In order to accurately determine the location of debris, a sophisticated sonic device was developed. The debris was also inspected by means of closed circuit television. A drilling barge was moved onto the scene and another larger crane barge was used as a base for probing of the river bottom. Whilst the underwater debris survey was being carried out, the exposed adjoining sections of the structure were thoroughly inspected. Thus, by May 1975, all the information required to make the engineering decisions on the restoration of the bridge had been painstakingly collected and collated. The Lake Illawarra settled on an even keel in about 40 metres of water, her bow badly damaged and forward sections covered with bridge debris. The bow was at the Pier 19 position. The hull extended in a southwesterly direction at about 25 degrees to the bridge centre line. Three 43 metre long spans between Piers 17 and 20 had collapsed. Piers 18 and 19 had been demolished down to silt level. The span between Piers 16 and 17 moved 150 millimetres on its rollers towards the gap, moving the top of Pier 17 with it. The columns were cracked. Pier 20 was severely damaged, the falling span had broken away nearly half the pile cap and some of the piles were exposed. Erection of a single 128 metre span was found to be impractical, which left three possible span restoration configurations to be investigated. The first and aesthetically most desirable solution was to replace the structure as it was with three concrete spans. The second possibility was the erection of a pier in the middle with two symmetric spans. The third was to erect a new pier at the original Pier 19 location, span between piers 19 and 20, with 43 metre concrete beams and between 17 and 19 with steel box girders. This third configuration was selected because it required the removal of the least amount of bridge debris and therefore would involve the shortest construction time. It was decided not to rebuild Pier 18 because of the removal problems presented by the Tangle Bridge wreckage. In addition, both Piers 17 and 20 were required to be replaced down to pile level. Demolition work began by removing and dumping the existing cap skirting units. In order to render Pier 20 safe for piling operations, which were to follow, the pile cap required temporary repair. Once this Pier 20 pile cap had been repaired, a steel tower was erected to support the columns and the superstructure during column and pile cap replacement and beam lifting operations. A similar tower was erected at Pier 17. 
Meanwhile, manufacture on the 14 2-metre diameter steel piles was well advanced. The pile sections were finally welded together at the loadout wharf. The biggest was 53 metres in length and weighed 65 tonnes. Sealed at the top and near the bottom, the piles were fitted with lifting lugs and water intake valves which made transport to the bridge site a breeze. They were simply lowered into the water and towed by tug to the site. A 30-ton capacity derrick crane began to lift the top end of each pile. The valves were opened as each pile was slowly lifted into the vertical position. With the caisson in position, the valves were opened completely and it was carefully sunk into the silt on the riverbed. The top diaphragm was then cut away and divers removed the lower diaphragm. A sound rock base was achieved by a repeated driving, rock chopping and grabbing process. When a suitable founding had been reached, the bottom was airlifted clean, inspected by closed circuit TV, and a tremie concrete plug poured in the bottom. This tremie concrete plug ranged in depth up to 21 metres. In all, four new vertical piles were installed at Pier 17, eight at Pier 19, and two at Pier 20. To maintain compatibility of stiffness with the original raking piles, a connection at the base capable of taking bending movement was required. This was achieved by installing rock anchors. Eight anchors per pile were used, each up to 32 metres in length. The anchors had a precast epoxy anchorage needle and the free length was sheathed in steel pipe. Concrete grout ensured maximum protection against corrosion. The holes for the anchors were drilled, sealed with cement grout and then reopened by rock rolling. They were then filled with cement grout and the tendons dunked into position. Each tendon consisted of 36 7mm BBR wires. Excess grout was displaced by the tendon. The vertical location of the anchor was set by the locking nut positioned in a template. In all, more than 4,000 bags of cement were used in the installation of the rock anchors. Once the anchors were installed, the piles were dewatered, the top of the tremie plug cleaned and a reinforced concrete anchor block cast. Extra care was required during the stressing because of the confined area. As soon as stressing was completed, the tendons received a secondary grout. On the western side of Pier 20, 0.6 metre diameter piles with reinforced ends were driven through the debris. With all piles installed, the weight of the superstructure was transferred to the new piles at Piers 17 and 20 to enable replacement of the columns and pile caps. The crosshead and column reinforcement was cut with a thermo lance. The 25-ton sections were then separated with a hydraulic jack and later dumped in the river. Each pile cap was removed by jackhammer involving up to 10 weeks of around-the-clock labour. Piles were trimmed and the false work for the new pile caps installed. New pile caps were poured in sections. At Pier 19, two pours of 350 cubic metres were required. At Pier 20, six pours, and at Pier 17, 10 pours. Concrete was delivered by chute to the base of Piers 17 and 20 and kibble to the required location. In all, 1,800 cubic metres of concrete was placed in the caps. Each kibble carried a full truckload of concrete. Once the centred core of the cap had been completed, the combined load of the towers and superstructure was transferred to the partially completed cap. At the same time, the columns began their steady climb upwards. Pier 19 began to take shape. Columns were poured in five metre sections with a three-day cycle. Stainless steel bases for rocker bearings were accurately set into the crossheads. The rocker bearings required precise machining to match the knife edges on the original beams. During the bridge collapse, the span between piers 16 and 17 had slid 150 millimetres downhill towards the gap. To make room for the new beams, and to provide an increased transverse stiffness to Pier 17 during construction, span 16 to 17 was jacked back and connected to the remainder of the structure, giving a horizontal moment connection at Pier 16. The jacking operation was performed using two BBR stressing tendons connected across the expansion joint at Pier 16. 
Meanwhile, at the Wilkinson's Point worksite, six new 43-metre concrete spans had been manufactured. At each end, an anchor block had been cast, poured on end to ensure sound concrete, and heavily stressed in two directions. The beams were cast as one unit between the anchor blocks and were stressed using nine post-tensioned cables. All six concrete beams were stored at Wilkinson's Point prior to being shipped to the bridge site. And at the nearby Derwent Park workshops of steel vanes, work was well underway on the four steel box girders to span the 85 metres between piers 17 and 19. The girders were designed to the Merrison rules and therefore required close tolerances to be strictly adhered to. Before incorporation in the pre-assembled sections of the girder, some plates were contoured using a 1,200 ton hydraulic press. Various components were assembled using manual welding and regular X-ray quality control inspection. The 3.6 metre high side plates were welded into place. The 12 metre long sections were manoeuvred into trunnions and rotated to allow welding to be carried out in the most preferred position. After prime painting, each 35 ton section was transported by road to the shore assembly area. Seven such sections were joined together to make each girder. Manual welding was used and all joints between sections were x-rayed. Shear connectors were welded onto the top flanges and the girders painted ready for transport to the bridge site. The girders were loaded onto two trolleys and moved out on specially made jetties to be loaded onto the transport barge which took them eight kilometres downriver to the bridge site. Here, two specially built 150 ton derrick cranes had been erected on top of the steel towers. The first girder was slowly lifted off the barge and onto the end of the towers and then slid sideways to its final position across the tower top. This delicate lifting and installing operation was repeated with each of the three remaining steel box girders. Then, on an historic day, 9th of May 1977, the first of the smaller concrete beams was lifted into place to span the void between piers 19 and 20 and for the first time in 28 months, the gap was again bridged. With all six concrete beams in place, the precast deck slabs could be positioned. On top of the deck slabs, a four inch coat of reinforced deck concrete was added. It had been decided to take advantage of the bridge closure to widen the Tasman Bridge from four to five traffic lanes, incorporating the deck space previously occupied by pedestrian walkways. New walkways would project outwards on steel cantilevers. The old carriageway curbs were demolished and abutment parapets cut away by diamond saw. Holes were drilled in the parapet to accept the steel cantilevers for the new walkways. However, to support this added weight, the edge beams had to be strengthened. First, these steel reinforcing strips were glued onto the deck. Slots were next gouged out to take stressing wires epoxy glued in place. The beams were then stressed by hydraulically jacking the stressing wires downwards at the mid-beam location, an operation which demanded constant monitoring. Services linking the two shores were then installed, including water mains, power and telephones. The old bitumen surfacing was cold planed and the entire bridge was given a new road surface. On Saturday, October the 8th, 1977, after nearly two and a half years of reconstruction, the Tasman Bridge was reopened.